Um, so welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this Insiders Outsiders event, um, which is going to be focusing on the life and history of Tom Blau. Um, and we have two wonderful contributors here to talk about Tom. Um, so his granddaughter, Emma Blau, and Julie Graham, who um, is uh, working as a specialist in photography, um, particularly um, looking at uh, Hungarian photography, um, Yusuf Kash in particular. So um, say a little bit more about, about both of them. But before I go on, if I could just ask everybody if you wouldn't mind um, turning off your sounds and your video, you can find both those buttons on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. That would be really great. Thank you. So my name is Carla Mitchell and um, I'm from Four Corners Centre for Film and Photography in London um, and I'm uh, here um, supporting this event um, which is run by the Insiders Outsiders Festival um, along with the Association of Jewish Refugees. Um, so just a little bit on our two um, wonderful presenters for this evening. So um, artist Emma Blau um, is Tom Blau's granddaughter um, and she's going to be in conversation with Julie Graham talking about Tom Blau's life and work. Um, so Emma is a celebrated photographic artist in her own right, uh, a curator whose work is held in the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery in London, as well as being exhibited nationally and internationally. Um, and she's also co-owner of Camera Press, which was set up by Tom Blau um, and directed and produced the documentary Camera Press at 70, A Lifetime in Pictures, made to celebrate their platinum anniversary. Um, Julie is a photographic consultant and curator and the senior representative for the estate of Yusuf Kash um, and in North America in association with Camera Press as well as running the Kash website and social media. Um, Yusuf Kash was the first photographer to join Camera Press um, and he and Tom Blau met in 1943 and they became lifelong friends. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that in a minute. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Emma. Thank you. Okay, so Tom Blau. I'll start at the beginning. Tom Blau, my grandfather was born in 1912 in Neukölln in Berlin. His mother and father had emigrated from Hungary to Berlin after the birth of their first child, Tom Blau's older sister, Rose. Tom Blau's father, Lajos, was a plumber and his mother, Sirica, was an exceptional and resourceful woman and also an amazing cook, apparently. And during World War I, when there were the Na British Navy blockades in Germany, um, she managed to smuggle food from agri agricultural Hungary and was known in the neighborhood for her fantastic cooking. So after the war, uh, someone put up the money for her to start Café Blau. And um, Café Blau was a cafe and a bakery and was hugely successful. Now, sadly, uh, Tom Blau's father ran up huge debts and in 1924 committed suicide when Tom Blau was just 12. For some reason I can't leave the slideshow on, hang on. Here we go. This is Tom Lau with his mother in Berlin. He's about 14 here, but when he was 12, he was tasked with having to speak to all of the people that his father had owed money to and the income tax officers to pay off all the debts. Uh, so he spoke to them on behalf of his mother. And this had a huge effect on Tom Lau and his mother's words at the time were look them straight in the face, straight in their eyes and do not be afraid. No one will hurt you and no matter how angry they may be with you, you'll be able to make some arrangement. And this was a useful lesson for Tom um, with his career in photography. So he excelled at school in Berlin with a particular aptitude for languages. He was introduced by Ladislas Farago, the Hungarian journalist and writer, who was a family friend, to another Hungarian gentleman, which is often the case in photography, uh, Mr. Bolgar, who was the head of the Berlin branch of Worldwide Photos, which was the photographic department of the New York Times in Berlin. So Tom started working there as a caption writer, translating English and German captions. In 1935, 
He came uh, to London to stay with a relative. And whilst he was in London, the Nazis closed the Berlin office of Worldwide Photos and he stayed in London. Uh, this photograph is actually taken by Ralph Crane, who went on to become a very celebrated life photographer, but who went to America, unlike my grandfather, who stayed in London. So the New York Times supported his application with the Home Office to stay on working in the UK, but didn't actually offer him a full-time job. So he worked as a freelance photo researcher, supplying the New York Times and a number of other um, other agencies, Keystone being one of them, who was also run by a Hungarian called Bert Garay. And in 1937, he offered Tom Blau a permanent position, which Tom Blau took up because he was having to send money back to his mother and sister in Berlin to try and get them back to Germany. At the end of 1938, he was headhunted from Keystone by a representative for Lee Garns, who was a Hollywood cinematographer. He did the lighting for Gone with the Wind. And he wanted to set up an independent photographic agency in London and Tom Blau accepted that proposition and he started running and set up Pictorial Press. Now I have Tom's Pictorial Press contract here. Um, he did start up Pictorial Press at the end of 1938. This is dated 1943. So whether nothing was formalized until 43 or they changed the contract in 43, but he was on nine pounds a week, as we can see here. So his earlier freelance work when he first came to London meant he'd tapped into all these sources for photography that other people hadn't, particularly from Russia. And it meant that Pictorial Press were hugely made a lot of money basically during the war because they had access to what was happening on the Eastern Front and no one else did. Um, this is the Battle of Stalingrad, for instance, in 1942. So Lee Garms had promised Tom Blau to make him a partner if the agency was successful, but he never made good on that promise. So in 1947, Tom Blau decided to leave Pictorial Press and set up Camera Press. And £2,000 here, he said he did, did so with a sum of £2,000. I've worked out in today's money, that's £80,000. So no small amount of money and quite a risk. But what made it all possible? Well, two things made it possible. This is Tom Blau's wife, Doris Chapman, also known as Chappie. Um, and she had 11 siblings. So it's a very large family. These are some pictures of my dad, their children. So my dad, John Blau on the left and their daughter, Nikki Blau on the right. So the Chapman family, as I said, were huge. Doris had a lot of siblings and, particular, and they all pooled their life savings together to enable Tom Blau to have the money to set up Camera Press. And the matriarch of the family, uh, Doris's mother here, was bedridden and used to keep her savings under the earth in a flower pot by her bed. And Tom Blau remembers her pulling, yanking out this flower from the flower pot, shaking off the earth and giving him 200 pounds of her entire life savings. He paid it back within 12 months with interest, by the way. Now, Don Chapman was um, Tom Blau's nephew. And I include him here because he really was the keeper of Camera Press's history. He joined Camera Press shortly after the war. There he is in 1950, there he is more recently. Um, he sadly passed away in 2016. He retired in the 1980s, but right up until he died, he was coming in once a week to um, work in the archive. And he was part of the whole Chapman family. And the other thing that made it possible for Tom Lau to set up Cameron Press was Yusuf Karsh. Now Yusuf Karsh on the left here, a young Yusuf Karsh, was born in Armenia in 1908 to Armenian parents. And in 1922, his family were able to flee to Syria to escape the Turkish atrocities. Karsh had an uncle, seen here on the right, George, living in Quebec, Canada. And when Karsh's parents managed to send Karsh to Canada in 1925, his uncle George sponsored Karsh as an immigrant. And George was an established photographer himself. And after schooling, Karsh went to work for George. Now, Karsh became a local photographer of note in Ottawa. And by 1941, the Canadian Prime Minister, William Lloyd Mackenzie King, was championing Karsh's work and set up a shoot for him with Winston Churchill at the Speaker's Chamber of the Canadian Parliament. This has become one of the most iconic portraits in history. Um, when Churchill refused to put down his cigar, and during the course of the photo shoot, Karsh very gently and politely leant over and plucked it from his puffing mouth and made what became known in Churchill's words as the Roaring Lion portrait. It's become known in this country 
as the bulldog portrait, but it's iconic, it's on our five pound note. So Tom Blau was responsible for signing Carte to Pictorial Press. This photograph was taken in 1941 when Tom Blau was still at Pictorial Press. And um, after Tom Blau saw this Winston Churchill portrait, he telephoned Karsh to ask if he could, at Pictorial Press, represent Karsh's work. And Karsh said, he offered to represent me on the strength of that one photograph alone, which he called an icon. So a great friendship began, and they met in person in 1943 when Karsh came to London. Now, Solange Karsh, who was his first wife, had told Pictorial Press when Karsh came to London, see that he gets the necessary ration cards and advise him about British manners which was Tom Blau was the man for that job. Estrelita Karsh, Karsh's second wife, remembers that Tom was to advise Yusuf on the procedures involved in photographing royalty on that trip. So in 1943, they worked together in the Savoy Hotel where Tom Blau arranged Karsh's first important international portrait settings, sittings even, providing material providing background material on Karsh's subjects and moral support when he was taking photographs. And when the wartime bombs fell, they would retreat to the Savoy Hotel basement and carry on. So this is a letter that Karsh wrote for our 50th anniversary catalogue. And he says, in 1947, Tom wrote me a moving letter. He wished to strike out on his own and form a photographic agency. My late wife, Solange, and I did not hesitate. We replied, it was you we wanted as our agent, and we know you'll make it a great success. So in 1947, Karsh left Pictorial Press to join Tom Blau as the first camera press photographer. And Tom was always incredibly touched by Karsh's loyalty in taking the risk and joining this new agency. So over the years at Camera Press, Tom Blau set up a number of portrait sittings for when Karsh was over in London, and some of them you can see here. Karsh and Tom Blau worked together on a handshake, and from then until now, a warm and formal contract-free relationship as close friends existed as well as colleagues. And on, we have Jerry Fielder, seen behind Karsh here, who was Karsh's assistant from 1979 and is now the director of the estate of Yusuf Karsh. And he can be seen later on uh, top, the top right picture. And the picture at the bottom is from a Canada House exhibition opening in 1998, where I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Karsh. And I was so thrilled because obviously I'd heard so much about how he was responsible for one of the reasons that Camera Press could be even started. So Camera Press's first photo assignment was to send the photographs from the wedding of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, taken by Baron on the left here, who is a friend of Prince Philip's, uh, to the world's press. And that's when our links with quality photographers and the royal family that have defined our agency over the years began. And I included also, because I've been going through the archives, this a brilliant letter from Baron, thanking my grandfather for his suggestion regarding the barmaids of Mayfair which was obviously a speculative shoot that uh, Tom wanted him to carry out. Quite frankly, by far the best person to do this would be my brother, were he able to handle the camera. He's been known as the BMD for years, which stands for Barmaid's Delight. I can't find these pictures in the archive, sadly. So, Camera Press was originally operated out of the basement of Russell Court, and Russell Court is where both Tom Blau and Doris Chapman, when she was Tom's fiance and later when they were married, um, that is where they both had flats. Um, and this is, gives you, it, they were the old air raid shelters essentially in the basement. And this gives you an idea. These were sent in to me by our old um, black and white printer, Cass. Uh, but it gives you an idea of just corridors and corridors of pictures, no daylight to be seen. And um, this is the dark room as well. So Tom Blau got into a lot of, he ran the business from the basement, but also from his flat and from Doris's, Doris's flat. And he got into trouble with the building manager because he basically used the service lift for transporting photographs up and down and was using, using it as, as his personal lift. And this, these are more contemporary obviously, but give an idea of how the production was all done in hard copy. This lady here was captioning, packaging material up. There's a courier waiting to take it off to Fleet Street. And when there were royal releases, the couriers used to go all the way down Coram Street all the way uh, down there. These are some of our staff who, uh, we have Roger Eldridge, who was our operations director. We have Lennox, who started at Camera Press when he was 16 and is still with the agency over 40 years later. 
Cassel printer, Regel color printer. So Tom Blau, from the beginning, quickly built up a reputation that attracted some of the greats from the era, like Beaton, Parkinson, Litchfield, Terry O'Neill, David Bailey, and Terence Donovan. And in particular, Snowden, as he was known professionally, Lord Snowden, we'll see in later years. So this is um, Snowden at his studio at 20 Pimlico Road, taken by Tom Blau. We actually, well, I say we, my grandfather, Tom Blau, camera press, took over Snowden's studio. Um, he had to give up the lease because basically with his burgeoning fame, um, there were always reporters outside whenever he photographed someone. So we took over the lease. There's Snowden doing a fashion shoot in the studio that we took over. And, um, but we had to give up the lease as well, actually, because of the same thing, reporters always hanging around outside. So Tom Blau um, would often go to Kensington Palace to see Snowden as his agent. And he writes in his autobiography about um, when Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden entertained me to tea in their lovely sitting room, which contained, amongst other things, large photo albums. They proved to contain photographs taken by Princess Margaret, some of them pretty good. All the royal family used cameras with skill and experience. As she turned the pages, I said to her, want a good agent? Alas, she replied, puffing out a little smoke. I can't, but I'd very much like to. So now, and I think Terence might be in the audience, so apologies not, for not warning you, Terry, Ter Terry, Terence. Uh, but I am going to play, if I can... Uh, 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 this is a clip of Terence when I interviewed him. He kindly agreed to be interviewed for Camera Press at 70, A Lifetime in Pictures, and he talks about some of the photos in the archive, if I can get this to work. Right, here we go, enjoy. Uh, my name is Terence Pepper, I was a curator of of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery in 1975 until 2014. Now I'm a freelance and uh, work in advisory role in the Portrait Gallery and the National Textile Museum. I've become a photo collector and uh, particularly looking for pictures taken by camera press photographers who were the best in the world. And recently I've acquired a number of interesting things I bought today. Norman Parkinson photographer, Elizabeth Taylor, working on a big exhibition of his work. He's going to tour around the world. And some marvelous pictures by John Kelly, uh, one of Big Jagger and Marion Faithful, which have never been published as far as I can tell. Um, pictures by Justin Deville and Twiggy. And um, most exciting, I found, I uh, discovered a whole a photographer whose work no one knew about, it's called um, Graham Keane, which is featured in Special Issue of the Observer of Underground London, who was who. And through this little print I bought, which didn't have a name on the back, um, and dragged down this photographer whose, whose work has come across syndicated and um, had a very successful exhibition at the Lucy Bell Gallery um, last year. And um, which has been bought by the um, Francis Bacon Museum in Monaco, and um, all, all as a result of this camera press print that got me going there. The back is often as interesting as the front, but the stamps and labels on it, the camera press are really good with their labels. It makes them authentic, but lots of, lots of people are too pirating and copying things which don't have labels. The camera press have visible labels that obviously emanated from the time they were first issued. Um, so that makes them highly collectible. The first game of Dutch Fish is Christine Gila. Well, I, when I was at school, um, we went and asked to the Musa World, but I looked at Epsom and we used to walk up to the train station by the Musa World on Sunday, um, which would have been just nice for everyone to seen this. But, um, of course, <laughs> the, the funeral story broke in um, the 60s and here is such a, a, a huge topic that endlessly fascinating. So when it was the 50th anniversary, um, if we can go to this into depth, I can find all the best pictures of Andrew Rice Davis and Christine Keeler. I found out that Tom Blau had done these amazing pictures, which weren't really well known and published at the time. But they were very kindly. Um, Cam Press gave us access to these. And um, we did a whole show, which was very popular, called Scandal 63. And, um, and Tom Blau was, was the star photographer for that. <laughs> Thank you. 
contacts for news and who to get in touch with. And um, it was just it should be a that should be a national museum of camera press photographs because uh, they were just so much better than all the photographers he worked with them than the other agencies. Um, it's wonderful that everything's more or less preserved. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely it's a fantastic history of photography that no one has done. Bought old volumes of Tatler and Sketch and then copying laboriously listing all the pictures in them, and it's extraordinary how many photographers were represented by Cameron Press. It was always sort of scrupulous and fair and, and gave a, a proper sort of um, royalty to people, and that's why people stayed loyal to him and, and Cameron Press generally. And um, he was also a great photographer himself. So thank you, Terence, for that lovely segment there. Um, so Tom Blau started taking photographs when he founded Camera Press because simply he couldn't afford to pay a full-time staff. And this led to a complaint in Cecil Beatson's diaries where he said he wished that his agent, Tom Blau, would stop taking photographs as he was losing out on work through him. And um, Tom Blau started out for publications such as Woman, Woman's Own, Every Woman, Beauty, Woman's Weekly, and Woman's Journal, which is uh, some of these images of Cecil Beaton at home appeared in in 1955. Before shooting regularly for Illustrated London News, London Life, Der Spiegel, the Daily and Sunday UK newspapers, as well as the famous American periodical Saturday Evening Post. And because of his background as a caption writer and from running pictorial press previously, Tom Blair had a really strong sense of narrative and what the press and publications like to publish kind of speculative shoots that he would go and do and then offer to the press. Um, this is something he shot shortly after the NHS was founded. His, his portraits were published in publications such as Time magazine, Life magazine, Picture Post and the Sunday Times magazine and more. This is uh, the Scottish artist Anna Zinkhausen with her daughter on the left and uh, one of her subjects on the right. And again, there's just this lovely sense of correspondence and letter writing. And you can see that the first picture back here was shot in 1948. This letter is from 1974. So there was an ongoing relationship of, that involved shooting her over a number of years. And um, she's accepting his kind offer for lunch here. So this is how it was set up. People wrote to each other and went out to lunch and happy them. Um, and here we have uh, Daphne. De Maurier, at her, and on the right here, she's at her Cornish home, uh, at her writing desk, where she wrote all her, her novels. And here we have Somerset Maugham, and again, a letter, but this, the picture on the left was shot in 1950, the letter on the right, which says it would be silly for Tom to fly over to the south of France uh, to take photographs of him, uh, because he'll be at the Dorchester in October, but um, that shoot didn't happen in 1960, but the one on the left in 1950, um, Tom Blau was on holiday in the south of France. He spotted Somerset Morn going into a pottery shop. They waited for an hour for him to come out. They approached him um, and asked, and Tom asked if he could photograph him. It was as simple as that. And um, Somerset Morn gave Tom his business card and said, call this number in a week's time, very specific. So Tom did. And when he called the number, it turned out to be the postmistress at the Antibes post office who fielded calls for Somerset Morn. But luckily the message, the reply came back that yes, Tom could go and photograph him the very next day. So Tom Blau was a real pioneer of the at-home shoot, which really wasn't so prevalent then. Here's some pictures of uh, the Olivier's, as they were then when they were married, uh, at Durham Cottage in Chelsea. Uh, very few pictures of them at home or of this cottage exist. These have been used quite extensively. And the uh, those two sets of pictures and the Somerset Morn actually ended up being acquired by the National Portrait Gallery uh, on the occasion of our 60th anniversary. So you had a lot more access to famous figures in the 50s and 60s, or Tom Blau definitely seemed to. Um, they would meet on holiday. Tom Blau used to go with his family, my uh, dad and my aunt and his wife, to Mallorca, um, where he would, he, he wasn't a paparazzi at all. He always got permission. He always, you know, they'd meet in the bar at the hotel. He'd get permission, he'd take photographs. 
He was also great friends with Peter Sellers and represented him as his agent when Peter Sellers started taking photographs. Um, Tom Blau photographed his daughter as well and asked her to stand on his uh, on Peter Sellers' Rolls Royce here, and apparently she scratched it. Um, but Peter Sellers was very charming about the whole episode. And I included uh, this Iris Murdoch shoot because Tom Blau mentions in his autobiography that she was very reserved, quite quiet. So he was thrilled when she wrote back saying, thank you so much, I do like these photos. I think they're a very good lot. Um, and again, it just shows, you know, the very extensive notes, the letters, uh, marking off of contact sheets. Um, and that's how things were done then. So I thought I'd show a couple of Tom's most famous iconic images. This one, obviously, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Tom Blau turned up to their um, house just near Ascot. Absolute chaos, loads of people around. They were in bed till noon. He had to wait a couple of hours. And when they did come down, uh, there was a massive piano in the, in the room. And he asked them to sit at either end of this big bench in front of the piano. And he asked them to slowly move together towards each other and look into each other's eyes as if they were falling in love all over again. And he did a whole series, but this was the kind of killer shot at the end when they were just about to kiss. And Christine Keeler, Terence spoke about this shot as well. Um, Christine Keeler, Tom Blau went and photographed her on set for a secret film test. Um, she was due to star in a film about her life. She, the film got made, but Yvonne Buckingham actually took the main role of her, but she did introduce the film very meta um, and it wasn't released in this country it was too scandalous but it was released abroad and it was included in scandal um, 63 this work which Terence curated um, at the National Portrait Gallery so Tom Blau photographed politicians here he is at number 10 photographing Harold Wilson also Robert Kenny Kennedy in the Attorney General's office film stars like Joan Collins pop stars of the day and Anthony Newley here this was for a shoot for Honey magazine this is Adam Faith again, a kind of at home, getting ready to go out on the town, I think, shoot. Um, this was also included in an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery uh, from Beatles to Bowie, the one on the right, I believe. And he also photographed uh, Aristotle Onassis for the Sassay Evening Post here. And the royal family, he was thrilled to be able to photograph the royal family. Uh, this is Prince Philip, and again, refer back to Anna Zinkhuizen, the Scottish artist. Um, this was for a study for her to do a portrait painting from. And he was absolutely thrilled to photograph Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother as well in the 1970s. But he also, and this is something that has a thread throughout the whole family with my dad as well, he also shot what was termed at the time magazine situation photographs, which is again, speculative setups that he knew women's magazines would run stories about unrequited love, no doubt. That's my mother staring at um, Jane Blau, staring at a photo of my dad on the wall. This is my dad being fussed over by both my mother and Nikki Blau there uh, on the left of him. Which moves us on to my father, John Blau, who obviously is a big part of Tom Blau's legacy. Again, that's my aunt Nikki in the back and my dad with his roller flex in the front. And this is my father with Tom Blau in the 1980s. Hastings and Bexhill Rugby Club, very important in my father's life. <laughs> and this is an interview with BAPLA, which is the British Association of Picture Libraries and Agencies, their first, um, uh, the first issue of their journal, where he was interviewed. Tom Blau sadly died in 1984, and my father took over as managing director shortly afterwards, and this was an interview he did then. But he mentions in this interview how he used to make his father, Tom Blau, quite nervous. Um, because, so my father started at Camera Press straight out of school after A-levels and he worked his way up over a number of years from the dark room making coffee, assisting photographers and then he became staff photographer, staff, sorry with two F's not star, uh, staff photographer for Camera Press and he used to make my grandfather very nervous because he was insistent that you could get the shot that you needed within three frames, no need for a motor drive, bish bash bosh. Um, and it just made Tom Bell very nervous because my father would go off on these shoots and not shoot many rolls of film. But according to Roger Eldridge, our operations director, he did always get the shot. Like these shots here, which is Louis Armstrong on the right and Sid James, uh, on the left rather, and Sid James on the right. And the shot of Louis Armstrong um, was actually, I'll 
mention it a bit later, but we opened a gallery called the Tom Blau Gallery in Tom Blau's memory. And the inaugural exhibition, this was the first, the Louis Armstrong print was the first print to be sold at that exhibition. So my father was very much a news photographer, press photographer, and um, shot these kinds of sto news stories, Bob Foster and Chris Finnegan before their fight. Also, news of the day, the British postal strike in the 70s, Maureen Baker, the design director um, of the company that designed Princess Anne's wedding dress, which was the hot topic, obviously, in 1973. He did a lot of on-set photography. There's Tom Jones on the set of his Christmas special there, and Pan's People, my personal favourite, that I used to dance around the living room to, Top of the Pops, that's them on the set of Top of the Pops. And my Again, my father went back to Windlesham House School where he went to shoot some general images for the library of schoolboys and they ended up being used on a, in a hymn book that a lot of uh, children of my generation or people of my generation when they were children had at school. It was for BBC Radio for Schools, Come and Praise, a uh, hymn book and I used to love sitting in assembly and seeing my dad's name on the uh, inside cover. Mm. And he also took photos of his family for syndication through the agency. And here I am in woman's own. I've changed gender. And apparently I'm refusing to eat, which was definitely not the case when I was a baby. And here's me on the shoulders of my dad when I was younger. And this was taken at Tom Blau's family home in Worthing and just uh, by the swimming pool with a pool house that was designed by um, Lord Snowden. Which brings me on to me. Um, and I was never set on a path of photography when I was young, just after my A-levels. I was adamant I was going to be an actress, um, but I couldn't go to drama school because I was 17 and you had to be 18. Um, I was moved up here at school, so I was like, what do I do? I went to Goldsmiths College um, to study media and communications because I also did media studies A-level. Um, and it was only in my third year of my BA that I even, not that I, I'd picked up cameras before, but it was the first time I kind of thought about photography. Um, and after graduation from my BA, I spent three years assisting photographers, working on national newspapers and magazines as a picture editor and picture researcher. And then I went back to Goldsmiths to do my MA. And it was then that I really started thinking about photography as an artistic tool to explore my own perceptions of the world around me and others' perceptions of the world around them. So this is work around the time of my MA. And then in 2002, I embarked on my first public art project with the charity Autism London. And I worked with a group of adults with high functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome to produce photographic portraits, which explore how those diagnosed often have a great difficulty with nonverbal social communication, particularly in a visual sense. And the last conversation I had with my father, my father sadly died in 2002. And that's when I did this project. So the last conversation I had with him shortly before his death, I told him about having secured the funding for this project. So he knew that this project was going ahead, but sadly never got to see it realized. And then Invisible Insights eventually was, um, it was nominated for the City Group Photography Prize, which is now the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation Prize. And it was a winner of the Flash Forward Award from the Magenta Foundation in Canada. So at the same time that I was doing my public art project, I was producing editorial portraits mainly for the Sunday Times magazine and Condé Nast, um, specifically British Vogue. And whilst I was shooting portraits and doing the public art project, I took over as director of the Tom Blau Gallery. This is actually a few years before I took over. This was our 50th anniversary exhibition, but it gives an idea of the space, Lord Litchfield, um, was on the board of trustees. And uh, this was a gallery we opened up uh, in memory of Tom Blau. So I showed, I curated a program of a mixture of shows from our archive, shows from camera plus photographers, and also show from contemporary photographic artists. I was also, I embarked on a project to shoot shoe designers, my one love, my one true love. Um, here in the UK. And then when I moved out to New York, I proposed to one Julie Graham, photo director of ZooZoom, a project where I'd shoot and interview New York shoe designers. And ZooZoom was, as it says here, the original online glossy. It was the first full frame kind of fashion 
mag- online fashion magazine founded by um, David McIntyre and um, the creative direction was from Mike Hartley. So I had a lovely time doing these and buying shoes. <laughs> and also when I was living in New York, I was commissioned by the Sunday Times magazine to photograph Tina Brown. And this portrait here ended up going into the National Portrait Gallery's permanent collection. And this is a public art project, Face Forward, that I did. And I, um, the area in North Marlebone where I live in Westminster was being regenerated by Westminster Council. And I wanted to do a project that focused on the local people in the area, including myself, uh, who lives here, um, and how it, the regeneration would affect them. And these were put up, as you can see here, they were displayed all the way through the Lisson Green Estate, all the way down Lisson Grove. Um, they were actually up when President Obama was staying at the American Ambassador's house nearby. So I was thrilled with that because his whole motorcade <laughs> drove down past them. But I didn't want to get out my camera to shoot it because I was worried his security detail might think I was trying to take aim and fire. And 209 Women was a project um, that marked 100 years since the first general election in which some women could vote, which was championing the visibility of women. And it was 209 portraits by women photographer of the 209 sitting women MPs at the time when I photographed Luciana Berger. This is the installation at the House of Parliament. Um, one of the curators was Cheryl Newman who kindly provided these photographs. Uh, there was the 209 women book. This is um, a portrait in the House of Parliament. And then it also went to the Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool. So I've continued to work on creative projects for Camera Press from our brilliant archives and extensive archives. This was a project I did with Thames and Hudson, Queen Elizabeth II, a photographic portrait. I wrote the introductory essay for the book. Um, here are some pages from the book and it was all material from our archives. And the portrait on the left here of the Queen in the green dress was um, specially shot by Lord Snowden for the book. And we had an exhibition to launch it. I included this because in my research, um, Cass, our black and white printer from Camera Press, sent me this photograph of Tom Lau and I realised it was out, taken outside the ivy and um, I knew that he sometimes had board meetings in the rooms upstairs there and liked to go there and it's kind of come full circle because I've curated a number of exhibitions at the club at the ivy, this was a Royal Wives in the 20th century, again all material from our archives. Um, and Camera Press at 70 which was a huge project we did for our 70th anniversary um, where we looked at the most iconic images by some of our top photographers of the most iconic people over the last seven decades. There's a lot of cars featuring here on the left and all the way through the years. We also have a lot of social documentary in our archives because obviously it's founded in 1947. We have material that predates that as well, so a huge amount of news material as well. We're also incredibly proud to uh, represent uh, BAFTA's portrait photography that they commission, their portrait portfolio. And this is Elio Sorci, which is, um, he was one of the first paparazzo. Uh, he was working in Italy and he famously broke the news of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton's affair on the set of Cleopatra. These are some of his uh, portraits that were put into the exhibition. It was an absolute joy to curate and obviously involve the whole agency pulling together material. So now our offices are in 21 Queen Elizabeth Street. Couldn't think of a better name of a street for an agency that's known for its royal portraiture. Um, and I'm a co-owner of Camera Press with my sister Sophie and Tom Blau's daughter Nikki's two sons, my cousins Giles and Daniel. And on the right here, these were actually taken when the archive was housed on the top floor of the building. It's now been put into its own secure storage in East London. But it gives you an impression of the extent of the material that we hold in our archives. And whilst we're incredibly proud, of course, to still handle the archives of some of the most legendary photographers like Terence Donovan, Sorchi, Snowden's Royal Collection, Beaton, Barron, Dorothy Wilding, we're really proud to represent the work of top contemporary photographers as well, some of whose work seen here. And our photographers continue to be asked by the royal family to take official photographs. Thus ends my little synopsis on the thread of the Blau family and Tom Blau's legacy.
That's wonderful, Emma. Thank you so <laughs> much. We're, we're going to hear from. Oh, everyone's got their microphones on. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Now and. Um, just to say to audience members, um, we're going to hear from Julie, and then do please, um, if you want to ask questions directly, you can turn your video on. Um, alternatively, you can put your questions in the chat. So thank you. Over to Julie. Brilliant. That was great, Emma. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for even asking me to do this with you, and thank our host, and thank everybody for being here today. Um, we do have a few questions in chat. I won't go on too long. I did want to just make a couple of points just to reinforce this relationship that, you know, I feel really honored to be in this continuum. Um, I feel like we've been really lucky to experience the best of mixing business with pleasure. Um, that clearly was the case for Tom. It was clearly the case for Yusuf Karsh, and I'd like to say it's clearly the case for you and I, Ms. Blau. Um, you know, really important. Um, I talked to Esther Lita Kosh a few days ago, see if she wanted to comment um, about the relationship with Tom. She really wanted to stress that they had this great understanding between them. They were influenced by their similar backgrounds. They had both escaped prejudice and, you know, much worse. Um, Esther Lita called Tom a pioneer, which I think is really gorgeous. Um, and she also said that he was really joyful when Yusuf was around. So the relationship was obviously really special. And as you've said, you know, no contracts, everything on a handshake. I'm in the same position with you guys and everything that you and I have done together in photography outside of our relationship with Camera Press. Um, we also have, as you said, Jerry Fielder is on the call today. He's the director. We work very closely with him. And he had met Tom many times. Um, but he only spent one day with him on his own. And that was when a piece of equipment uh, that, that Jerry and Yusuf were working on a shoot in Paris and some power converter failed. So Jerry had to hop on a plane, fly to London. Tom Blau picked him up, took him to get a replacement from the Savoy. Um, and they spent hours chatting together. Um, it sounded like Tom, you know, really took good care of Jerry. And they spent a few hours talking about the Blau Kosh friendship, their mutual admiration and their gratitude towards each other, which I think is really lovely as well. And this warmth still continues. You've got staff members at Camera Press who've been there for decades, and that is just something that's really unheard of. Camera Press as a company has definitely succeeded um, where lots failed. So to have more than 70 years in the business is amazing. I ran my own photo agency, and by the time you know the mid 2000s had come along, and the challenge of being digital was enormous. Um, to see Camera Press ride through that and maintain this incredible position, still maintain the Royal Photography and continue to sign all these big names photographers is really, really something. Um, I'm fascinated to see the different styles between you and your dad and your grandfather. You obviously all really loved shooting people. Um, those, those early pictures, those contact sheets you showed at the National Health Service, you know, shot on a medium format camera. Uh, were absolutely gorgeous. Can you speak at all to the different styles? Would you say, you know, you've grown, you grew up obviously um, among a lot more photography than the average person. Um, yeah. did, did, your, did that influence you? Um, I, th I think it's only in, as always in life, it's only in kind of retrospect that you see these things as, but when you're in it, so when I was a child, my father was very much a working news photographer. So it wasn't something he brought home other than taking photographs as we saw to put in women's own. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and always, you know, he always had a camera taking the family photos and they were always in black and white, whereas a lot of people's were in color, I guess, with an Instamatic camera. But um, yeah, so his stuff was much more news-based. He loved portraiture, he loved photographing people. But um, I think my grandfather, picked up a camera out of necessity because as I said you know he had to but but loved it uh, and had a particular skill at photographing people in relaxed surroundings when that wasn't always the norm back then. My own work um, I came came at it from a very different angle in that I I went to art school and also was studying kind of communications and theory 
but the research aspect was always there. So, I mean, I used to work at Camera Press in the library during the holidays as a holiday job when I was at uni. So now I can see that kind of research curating instinct was definitely like fired up then. In terms of my own photography, it took me a while to work through because I kind of came to it in my own time and on my own terms. And I think that was something, you know, Tom Blau died when I was eight, so I didn't get a chance to talk to him about my photography, but my dad, the very early stages of my career, I did. And I think he was always very proud that I kind of did it my own way. Um, he saw my MA show, which I kind of glanced through there, which was very much kind of industrial landscapes and public architecture. And he was always, he always loved coming to the exhibitions, but he kind of said to me, well, you, you know, you, you, you're on a different level to what I was on. So it's different, but, as you get older, you see the kind of thread that runs through all our work, as you say, portraiture, particularly. Can, were you influenced, in, especially by any photographers? I mean, if you look at, you know, you look at the public installation and outdoors, you did obviously a couple of names, you know, spring to mind. Is there anyone in particular, given that you didn't, it took you a while to sort of come around to photography? Yeah, it did. I mean, I just kind of, you know, it didn't land on my lap, but it was just that it happened or get more organically and not through, you know um press photography like it did for my dad um i was influenced not even influenced but when i was researching for my ma it was much more people like gursky and the kind of photographic slightly more detached artists um as i've got older lee miller is an absolute you know uh, for me because everything she did you know she's a woman she did a b c she was a model she was fun race knew she was this she was that and i i love her work as well but i wouldn't say that influenced my work because i've come to her post doing my own work so um i also love you know i do love a lot of the archive work that we represent we used to um represent the archive of terry o'neill and i love his stuff i just love his stuff on set and some of the images he captured and but it, as I said it's a bygone age you know we're operating in a different age now so although I don't take those type of photographs I, I don't think I'd want to but um yeah sorry <laughs> and, all, and all the ephemera that went on around it we certainly had that with the Kosh archives as well the letters back and forth prior to the shoot after the shoot it's you know there's so much there that and and, and Terence talked about this that the camera presses you know, was definitely in the forefront of those captions, detail, um, and and seeing that translate to digital has been really interesting as well, because it's been a very huge challenge for all of us uh, in the photography business. The camera press has adopted a similar attitude to when they digitize work, mm. having all that captured information there, which is really, really crucial. Um, as far as you know, digital, like we, you can press and yourself um, adopted social media relatively early. Uh, gosh, we just went on Instagram a couple of years ago. Please follow us. Um, how do you think, you know, Tom and even your dad would have felt about something like Instagram? My dad would have loved Instagram. Well, okay, there's two angles. As photo agents, there would have been a lot of. Um, chasing people for usage fees, I'm sure, <laughs> on Instagram. Um, but my dad would have loved Instagram. My dad was obsessed with film, actually, uh, moving image as well. So he would have loved Instagram. I know he would, because he, he, he did love moving image, visual images as a observer, as well as taking photos. I think Tom Blau would have, I mean, I think he'd love Instagram as well. Just that instant way to visually communicate with people, but, at the back of his mind, because he was a businessman, it would be, you know, do you have permission to post that? <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> absolutely, it's a huge challenge. And I think both Camera Press and Kosh, we accept that, you know, my feeling is there's thousands, if not tens of thousands more eyeballs seeing our work than could see it otherwise. So, you know, connecting fans, for example, you were telling me the other day that the Vivian Lee fan base is one yeah. really enthusiastic. Um, I think we've experienced that as well. Um, but, you know, just to be able to keep the work alive in front of people. Yeah, by... I... Sorry to interrupt. So you deal with legacy. We both deal with legacies, right? And I, I was talking to my mum uh, a couple of days ago on the phone and 
you know, what Tom Blau achieved and what Yusuf Kosh achieved as well is so important and so, you know, fascinating. And it deserves to, to be kept, that memory deserves to be kept alive because it is something special. And, you know, people like that don't come along all the time. And to have that tenacity and determination to just keep going in the face of incredible adversity, be it having to move to a different country, be it not having the funds to, to do what you want to do, to make those steps and very conscious steps to, and, and to have that legacy is something I feel that just has to be celebrated. Um, we do have a few questions in the in the chat window, one of which is what actually got Tom into celebrity photography. So I think you've kind of nudged around the corners of that a bit. It sounds like it was need and business savvy. Funny. No, um, <laughs> I mean, we, we, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that he had to work his off when he first started Camera Press because he was, you know, he was thrilled to represent Karsh's work and Barron's and the early photographers, but he had to have constant material coming in so um but you know he had a tremendous amount of respect for britain and the way british business operated and for the royal family i mean he was so so um touched and it was so important that he got to work with the royal family he would you know to have that trust put into put in to your agency and also that discretion as well tom tom blau was very discreet i think i mentioned to you the shoot with christine keeler didn't go into his autobiography you know he didn't tittle tattle in that way um so yeah i think there was a level of trust as well with celebrities because he always allowed people picture approval which again well, i mean even to this day well now agents insist on it don't they but um you know so i think that, and I think he was fascinated by people and people's stories. We've got a couple of questions um, and we've also got somebody who's appeared on the screen who in fact asked one of the questions. So Jana, would you like to ask your question directly? You'll need to unmute yourself. Can you do that? Yeah. Well, I think that was actually my question. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm glad I asked I still I still think there's something special about having access to that kind of people. I, uh... Yeah, well, apparently there was a hotel in Mallorca. I, I want to say Esplendido, but I might have made that up. My kind of overly dramatic head. Um, and that's where every, because I mean, travel, international travel for holidays and stuff wasn't that common in the 50s. Um, so that's where everyone stayed. And literally there's, there's tales of, you know, Chappie, Dor um, Doris Blau her nickname at the bar and everyone had their children there on the beach and people just got chatting that's how we photographed tom jones and his family Lawrence olivier with his third wife and his family um there's a whole host of people and as i said with somerset morton he literally went up to him gave him his business card and wrote he wrote speculatively to people that's how he got to photograph kennedy um he robert kennedy he he just wrote to him and said, I, and also Henry Kissinger, he wrote to Henry Kissinger and said, I just, can I photograph you? And they said, yes. Great. Thank um, you. We've got a couple of, couple of questions which are both um, related to Tom's immigrant experience. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll read them both out if, if that's all right and you could address mm -hmm. both of them. Um, so the first one is um, what difference, and this is from Celia Frank, what difference do you think Tom's immigrant experience made to his career? And does it continue to influence you? And the second one um, is from um, Marie. Um, she says, this isn't Tom, it's his wife, Marie. Um, Mari. Not, Hi, Mari. Mari <laughs> not Tom, MJ. Um, <laughs> As someone else has asked, how do you think Tom's experiences in having to leave everything behind influenced him? Um, I've been lucky enough to work with the legacy of Judith Kerr, who also left Nazi Germany behind and made a great contribution to the cultural life of the UK, i.e. the tiger who came to tea. Uh, there seems something really rich about the migrant asylum contribution to British life. Is that a context you see Tom in? And is there a conversation to be had about different standards today and then, and uh, today and then, yes. Okay, I can't even remember the first one now, but I'll try. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it was about the my, do you see? experience and how it influenced his career and has it influenced mine. Um, yeah. So, 
I mean, it's it's that adapt. It's just that I want to say chutzpah, which is um, you know, just to keep on keeping on. I think um, you know, he came here. He had to. Everything was born out of necessity, and it's the mother of all invention, as they say. So yes, absolutely. That he needed to when he first got here. He needed a job. He needed to sustain himself. He needed to sustain his mother and um, sister back in Berlin. So then he took a full time job. Then he pushed it more because you know he needed more money and he needed and he was making money for other people and I think it's that thing of continually moving and and moving on but also setting up a you know a stable family life for himself with you know his his wife his children um set, setting up a business that would support his family you know after he had gone um I think there's that inherent immigrant experience that that's really important. I think it's important to everyone to know your legacy, but I think there's a certain matter of urgency that you get um, with the immigrant experience. Um, and the other question was? Um, so again, I guess to do with the richness of the, the migrant contribution to British life, um, and is that a context that you see Tom in? Um, and is there a conversation to be had about different standards then and today? I mean, yes, there always is, but there's always a conversation to be had and we need to constantly reassess people's lived experience and how it's contributed to the society we live in today. But, and Julie and I have spoken about this, that generation didn't really talk about their experiences that much. I mean, in Tom Blau's autobiography, there's. He, he does, and I was quite surprised, of all the vast ramified family I had in Budapest and in the countryside, the great majority had been exterminated in the concentration camps, mainly at Auschwitz. There now only remains my nephew, and um, Tom Blau's nephew lives in Budapest to this day, Tamas, we knew him as Tommy, um, and he's a successful uh, stage theatre director, musical theatre director at the Madax Theatre in Budapest. But that that's it, and I asked my mother if you know, apparently my father had tried to speak to Tom Blau or asked him about it and, and Tom Blau didn't want to talk about it. So it's um, it's interpreting what they did say and kind of reading between the lines of what that might mean. Um, so it's a conversation we need to have, but being two generations on, obviously it's easier for me to have it, but I didn't live that experience and it wasn't spoken about that much because to go through that kind of experience you know, one can only imagine and wouldn't want yeah. to imagine. Yeah, well, that, and, and that's probably why there's so much work now with sort of second and third generation yeah. interpretations of, of all that history. Yeah. Uh, um, I've, I've got a question, um, if I may, um, which was more just to do with the archive now and, um, you know, maybe asking you a bit more about um, what you're hoping for it in the future, if you have any you know, ideas about how you might develop and, um, you know, work um, with it. With the archive? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the archive, as I said, it's been moved to a site-specific location now. So there's always, um, you know, Camera Press is very much a working photo agency. Mm -hmm. So there is daily production that has to get done that is our bread and butter, as you say, uh, as we say. Um, and the archive material, a lot of it is scanned and a lot of it is published. Obviously, we have an art, we have someone who works in the archive constantly scanning new material. I delve into the archive for projects like um, Queen Elizabeth Photographic Portrait, our 70th ex exhibition, but there's always more that can be done with the archive and we're always discussing plans of what to do with the archive. Um, it is vast <laughs> and we are one of the last truly independent agencies that have that kind of vastness of, of archive. So, but we're always, we're constantly scanning material and we're constantly working on it in terms of day-to-day -day publication of stuff. And then I dip into it and others dip into it mm. for creative projects. Great. And I'd just like to say that my cousin Giles has confirmed that the name of the hotel in Mallorca was Four Mentor. So there we go. <laughs> That's where all the celebrities went <laughs> on holiday. Excellent. <laughs> Um, Mon Monica would like to ask a question. Monica. 
Yes, perhaps I'm not asking it at quite the right time because it should have come earlier, but I was very struck, you know, the world in which your grandfather appeared to be operating was a very, very different one to the one uh, occupied, I'm thinking particularly a picture post and the whole cohort of mostly emigre photographers with a strong social conscience, but also with an eye to the popular. And I just wondered, was there any way in which their paths intersected at all? Uh, the, the America, the, the, all the Hungarian photographers across the world. <laughs> no, 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 well, no, no, with picture post stuff and around, of course, of Hungarian origin. Yeah, well, um, well, actually, that's an interesting point. It speaks a bit to your point, but you know, there were so there were a number of Hungarian Jews that left Nazi Germany and set up photographic endeavors and became photographers. Frank Selby at Rex came to London. He set up Rex in 1954, so a bit afterwards. But also Robert Kappa, of course, who founded uh, it was a collective, but Magnum in Paris in the same year as Camera Press. Um, and in fact, Camera Press were Magnum's London agents before they had a London office. Um, and his brother, Robert Kappa's brother, Cornell Kappa, my grandfather, knew well. Um, I think there was crossover, particularly when Camera Press, I mean, Camera Press was, it was different from the keystones in the pictorial press. Tom Blau had different material. It had a lot of portraiture. And it's at one point, at some point, most photographers from America from the, would have had material at Camera Press. They might not be with us now because there's a plethora of agencies now, but um, yes, they were, you know, it, it was quite a, not a small pool, but yes, they did know each other. The other person who comes to mind is Krasna Kraus, who of course ended up. Yeah here as well. And the Hungarians, I have the impression with the Korda family as well, that actually there was quite a, not exactly cliquishness, but a sort of support system kind of yeah. within the Hungarian emigre community. Interesting. But Carla, let me hand back to you. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, just to invite any final questions from the audience, please do either turn your video on or, or ask any other questions you have. Um, you have a question of the kicking of a corgi. <laughs> Who, who asked that? Uh, one of your rallies. <laughs> My sister, perchance? No. no, it was, I think it's Tom's wife pretending to be. Uh, uh, no, no corgis were holding me um, in the filming of this. No, it was, um, I think it was when my father went to photograph the no, it must have been my grandfather. I can't remember. Someone went to photograph the Queen Mother and a corgi got a little aggressive, but it wouldn't have been my father because he was an animal lover. So I don't know where that story originated, but I'm denying it ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a gentle push was <laughs> applied to the corgi to get out of the frame. <laughs> Anyone else? I just, actually, I can see the chats now, so. Uh, um, I just wanted to ask a final question, which is probably an impossible one to answer to some extent, but um, it just is, an, I'm just struck by, you know, the connection between Hungarian Jewish photographers and, well, Hungary in particular, in terms of the production of, of photographers and people involved with photography. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts or comments on that. Um, I seem to remember reading somewhere that more photographers came out of Hungary than, you know, anywhere else in the world. Well, the thing that struck me, because Tom Blau was born in Berlin, um, and Berlin was his home, mm -hmm. hometown before he came here, but what struck me is there were already a number of Hungarians who helped start his career, as I mentioned, um, at the New York Times photo department, which was Worldwide Photos in Berlin, the guy that ran that was Hungarian. The guy that introduced Tom Lau to that Hungarian gentleman was Hungarian. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what, what's in the water in Budapest and the rest of Hungary, but that obviously our creative genes are flowing through the Hungarians of that, particularly of that generation as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. We, we've been left with fantastic archives by fantastic photographers. So um, yeah, lucky us. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. If you wanted to add anything, Julie, in terms of cash and... Well, Sophie's asking if you've got any funny stories about Tom, but that's putting you on the spot a bit, so... Um... Funny stories about Tom? Um, no, none that are safe for broadcast, no, <laughs> But, um, yes, oh, my cousin Giles said apparently my dad did give a corgi a gentle shove with his sandal, so there we go. Right. Oh, the sandal, that doesn't count as a kid, it's just a sandal. Oh, well, that's a good story. So um, I can't remember. Oh, mum, chat now. Um, there was a, there was a, a, a Lord 
Oh, Mum, put it in the chat. Mom. It was uh, Lord Hailsham. Thank you, Mother. Lord Hailsham. My dad always wore um, sandals, like Greek style sandals. That's what he was known for wearing. And it was Lord Hailsham admired them on a shoot. Really, really liked them. <laughs> But I'm health and safety wise, I don't I wouldn't encourage the young photographers of today to be wearing Greek sandal leather sandals on shoes. <laughs> In, indeed, or, 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 or anyone else. <laughs> um, I don't really have any other questions. I feel like most things have been covered. If anyone's got any last questions or comments, please do unmute yourself and uh, the cameras. Let me see you. And we've got a comment. Ah. Barbara Peter. Hi, hi Barbara. Hi, hi Peter. When we were, and you were very, very little, we all went on holiday together, and the best photos I've, that we've got of our children uh, are black and white photographs taken by John Blau oh. on that holiday. I've got, I found one of those in the research for this, and we're sat on a car bonnet, the kids. <laughs> That's right. I should have put it in the slideshow. <laughs> in our oh, that's good to know. Where did you find all those bits and pieces? Was that stuff that was already digitized over time for other needs? I mean, because you can't physically get to the archives at the moment. So massive shout out has to go to Lennox Smiley, Jackie Wald and Wanda in our archive because um, some of them were downloaded from the website. Obviously Tom Blau's most famous shot, most of Tom Blau's uh, famous work is, is on, camera pre on the Camera Press website, but sometimes things had to be got, gotten from the archives. So thank you to Jackie for fielding my constant emails and passing those on to Wanda. Um, I have some personal photographs that my father kept taken by Tom Lau, taken by my dad. Um, press cut, the press cutting with me in one zone was um, my dad's effects. Um, yeah, so they were got from, and Cass who, uh, when we had a, we used to have a black and white dark room and a color dark room. We don't now because everything's digital, but he sent, loads uh, the black and white photos of the um old camera press and the one of tom blau outside the ivy um and the national portrait gallery is a really good reference tool for me is because they acquired um a, a lot of uh, tom's work and it's a really nice selection on their website as well of images and i know my grandfather would be so so thrilled that i mean he's had displays there he's had exhibitions there since he died and also that that, that his work's there for posterity so um yeah, the various sources, but, but but a big thank you, obviously, to Cameron Press because they always have to field my emails before when I'm in the run up to events like this. <laughs> As does my mother, thank you, mum, and the rest of the family. So, <laughs> got um, <on. laughs> we could just go over to Monica, who I think wants to say some final things um, at, at the end of the event. So, over to you, Monica, and thank Emma and uh, Julie so much. That's been really, really fascinating. So. Absolutely. Ooh, I'm just so sorry, Monica. Just to, go, go ahead. Go on. My sister has just messaged the chat saying that Tom Blau taught her how to play chess. And when I say play chess, I mean <laughs> that we would make up stories about the pieces and then demand that I had won the game. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> he was very, he was very <laughs> good with children in that respect. Let her win. Lovely. I just had a very practical question, actually, just as a last one. I mean, how has it grown in size? Presumably, it's hugely larger in the number of staff employed now than it was in the earlier days. Or, or not? Have you kept? No, in the earlier days there were sixty plus staff. I mean, it was a because everything was hard copy. So there's a black and white dark room with printers, a color lab with uh, processors. Um, there was a production department. We also had an editorial department. So essentially, working almost like a newspaper. So there were not just captions, but whole story mm -hmm. sets with photos. Um, we had about four flats or something in Russell Court that one was used as a colour library, one was used. So because it was hard copy, it necessitated many, many more staff. And obviously with everything going digital now, that, it, you know, like all photo agencies, there's been a reduction in staff and everything is um, digitised. But no, in, well, I mean, when Tom Blau started it, it was literally just him. But um, he writes in his autobiography actually about how he then took on a secretary and an accountant and a lawyer and that's kind of what he needed but then it, it really grew probably in the 80s was when it had the most number of staff but just because of the sheer production of hard copy work yeah 
I should have I should have known the answer myself. But yes, thank you very much. Anyway, let's round things off. Unless last chance for any question or comment. I think probably the evening's drawing on. That was absolutely wonderful, entertaining, fascinating. I'm sure everybody agrees with me that it was completely enjoyable. Um, it's been recorded and the recording will be uploaded within the next week or so onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. Uh, and apropos, the question was it from Mari about the broader context of the immigrant, you know, uh, contribution. Um, those of you, she perhaps doesn't know, but some of you will, that the Insiders Outsiders Festival, which I uh, had the idea of some years ago now, but which actually ran as a nationwide real life sort of year long arts festival from March 2019 to March 2020, has continued despite or indeed because of COVID to have a very rich afterlife in the form of a fantastically diverse, though I say it myself, program of online events, very much ongoing. And this is actually the last, some of you may have attended some in the last two weeks. Um, this is the last of this particular program, but there's much more to come. Carla and I have, have collaborated many times already in the past. Uh, and I imagine Carla, I very much hope that we will continue to do so. Um, so keep an eye out if you're interested in this broader issue of the immigrant and particularly the contribution of the refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture, go to the insidersoutsidersfestival.org website. Uh, you can check the what's on section, but also sign up to the newsletter, which you can do very easily at the bottom of each uh, page of the website. And we'll have a new newsletter in April and there's much, much to come. <laughs> Um, and uh, just apropos actually the royal family, I can't resist saying that the next event is actually on the 8th of April and it's a totally different medium, but it's by a, um, a Czech-born Jewish photographer, uh, photographer, sorry, sculptor called Frank Tabelsky. I don't know if that's a name remotely familiar to any of you, but he had the rather remarkable sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, achieved the very most unusual thing that he actually sculpted, I think not just one or two or three, but actually four different generations of the royal family from very different you know alien beginnings to reach that kind of uh level of, of, of attainment so anyway so that's on the eighth but yes so keep keep an eye out keep uh, keep looking at the website so it just remains for me to thank Carla to thank Julie and particularly Emma everybody I don't know you can sort of clap if you, if you wish uh, silently <laughs> or otherwise and oh, uh, thank you can I, I just quickly <laughs> say thank you Monica thank you Carla thank you Julie check out cash.org for amazing cash photography Camerapress.com for Camerapress, emmablau.com for myself. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All, right. All the best, everybody. Thanks. Thank for you so much, everyone. It's been great.